caught in the SF Vortex. We're all doing flips as the last chapter of the Star Wars saga makes it back to the big screen with new footage. Settle down now, because David Cronenberg's latest twisted metal flick is ready to crash into theaters. Is there something here that interests you? You tell me. We have it all. Trailers, traitors, and even starship troopers in the war room. So get your weapons loaded. You know how to use these things? No idea whatsoever. That doesn't matter. You don't need them anyway, as we get ready to jump into the world of sci-fi entertainment. Let's go. And don't forget the droids. We're on our way. Everybody, I'm Roger Lodge, and this is SF Vortex, and you've arrived at your one-stop shop for all the latest news and previews of the week in the wonderful world of sci-fi entertainment. So get ready for some tantalizing tidbits on David Cronenberg's latest film, Crash, and if that's not enough, we'll visit Sherwood Forest, courtesy of TNT's Robin Hood. And later on in the war room, trailers, folks. No, not those bumper cars thrown around a twister. We're talking movie trailers. Do they sell the film or sell it out? But first, up first tonight, unless you've spent the last few months vacationing on Dagobah, you know that The Return of the Jedi, the third and final film of the Star Wars Special Edition trilogy, opened on Friday. Now, Star Wars has already earned an estimated $131 million, and The Empire Strikes Back raked in more than $51 million in their re-release. And as with the earlier films, Creator George Lucas has added some new scenes and special effects to Jedi. There's a new blues musical number that takes place early in Return of the Jedi. An addition of two minutes really turns Jabba the Hutt's palace into a rockin' party house. But it was meant originally to be a big musical number, uh, which I thought would be funny in the middle of the Star Wars film. Cy Snoodles, who was the main singer, was very limited. She couldn't move around. She had to stay in one place. Uh, her lips just barely moved. Her eyes didn't move at all. She just, it wasn't what I'd hoped it would be. So this gave me the opportunity to go back turn that into the musical number that I'd hoped it would be originally, uh, make a size noodles that actually can sing uh, and, uh, and move around on the stage. And uh, we've got another couple of characters and some backup singers and some drummers, and it's much more elaborate sequence than it was before. <laughs> Also enhanced is the sandpit scene where Luke, Leia, and a blinded Han clash with Jabba's henchmen. Now, originally, the fearsome Sarlacc creature didn't get too much on-camera time, but Lucas has made up for that by adding an enormous tentacle or beak to almost every pit shot. Let's go, and don't forget the droids. We're on our way. Luke's the man, isn't he? You know, George Lucas did trim the final Ewok victory celebration on Endor. Did you know that? <laughs> well, yeah, come on. I'm going to miss those furry little party animals. Anyway, folks, next week, we'll take a look at the reissue of the entire trilogy in a special Star Wars edition of SF Vortex. But now, let's travel from the far reaches of space to the highways of Earth. You know, on his newest single, Dave Matthews sings Crash Into Me, and it appears that director David Cronenberg obviously agrees in his latest and, of course, controversial film. But be warned, folks, this film is not for the squeamish. It definitely earned its NC-17 rating for violence and graphic sexual content. Crash stars Rosanna Arquette, James Spader, and Holly Hunter as members of a bizarre autoerotic cult. Is there something here that interests you? This interests me. 
I'd like to see if I can fit into a car designed for a normal body. J.G. Ballard's 1973 novel first asked, what is it about the car crash that touches a vital part of human existence? In Fine Line's version, director David Cronenberg provides some startling answers. I mean, the guy who just gets into his car in the morning and doesn't think twice about the incredible technology that went into creating the car, electronically, fiber optics, uh, combustion, everything. Um, that's a perfect fusing of man and machine. It's not on the racetrack. It's just the normal guy driving to work and not thinking twice about it. So um, in order to kind of illuminate our relationship to technology and how we absorb it into our bodies, uh, as well as our nervous systems and our minds. This, that is sort of an underlying sort of sci-fi discussion that goes on in the film. For example, the car crash is a fertilizing rather than a destructive event. A liberation of sexual energy, mediating the sexuality of those who have died with, with, with an intensity that's impossible in any other form. <laughs> experience that, to, to live that, that, that is, um, that's my project. Now, I would imagine that their insurance rates are a little on the high side. <laughs> crash opens March 21st, despite Ted Turner's efforts. And let us know what you think, folks. Did this one crash and burn? It's a must for a future war room debate, don't you think? But if you're looking for sex appeal without the automobile, then take a trip no further than Sherwood Forest. Each week, witty and wily Robin Hood, played by our old war room buddy Matthew Peretta, is joined by his band of merry men, including the jovial Friar Tuck, gentle giant Little John, and a leather-clad Maid Marian. Now this week, Robin's family is trapped in a castle with an evil band of rogues. Kind of hate when that happens. And once again, it's up to Robin to the rescue. Give me three and go for it. One, two. Oh. Oops. Get him! How to do it. At least he had the good sense not to try an English accent. Check him out, folks, Monday night on TNT. You know, there's a couple of other new episodes to watch this week. The X-Files will be airing part one of a two-parter involving a commercial plane crash caused by aliens. <laughs> You'd think those guys would know how to fly by now. And on Chris Carter's other cheery show, Millennium, Frank Black must decide if an admitted serial killer really committed the heinous murders. Be afraid. Be very afraid. But tune in Friday night at 9 on Fox. Coming up in the War Room, folks, we look at feature film trailers. You know, the mini movies created to lure us moviegoers to the theater with promises of thrills, spills, chills, and heartache. But do they show too much? We'll answer that question and many more when SF Vortex returns. All right, welcome back to SF Vortex, and we have made it down to the war room. And joining us today, we have three newcomers, folks. Jeff Walker is here, a marketing consultant for Genre Flicks. Jeff was one of the men responsible for the record-breaking box office success of Batman back in 1989. Very impressive. All right, also here is James E. Brooks, a freelance writer and film critic, whose credits include Expose, Starburst, and Film Review. And also joining us, Tom Davis, host of the Sci-Fi Channel's very own Trailer Park. <clears throat> and Tom was also one of the writers of the Coneheads movie. First right. draft. First draft. Yeah. All right. Guys, welcome to the show. Your first time. Excited to be here? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, here we go. My first question, the trailer. Obviously, one of the studio's big marketing tools. But in a lot of cases in today's films, 
The movie itself is almost a letdown after we see these big trailers, i.e. The Island of Dr. Moreau, what was going on in that film, and then Relic, the same thing. Uh, Jeff, what do you think? Well, it's been known to happen, but, but you have to bear in mind the trailers are cut by a completely different group of people than are, than are cutting the film at any given right. time. And so they're, they're doing without having seen the film, and they're cutting it, basically taking the best stuff from a movie that, are, that they feel is going to appeal to the given viewership. Tom? Well, I host a show right on the uh, right Where? on the Sci-Fi Channel. Oh, really, on the Sci-Fi Channel. Yeah, it's What's the name of it? Uh, it's called Trailer Park. Okay, okay. <laughs> and, go right ahead. And that, the concept is that <laughs> trailers are sometimes more entertaining than the actual movies, and all we do is show trailers. Uh -huh. And uh, we got picked up again, so it well, must be entertaining. Well, there's a little <laughs> plug. All right, very cool. Uh, Jim, what do you think? Well, I think the uh, probably the pithiest expression I saw of that was uh, when I was in college. They had a a guy who made his living making trailers. And the first thing he said when he started talking was, you know, I'm paid to lie to you. Ah, huh. So. Okay, well, there you have it right there. Well, speaking of trailers, you know, Men in Black, the movie, scheduled to be released July 2nd. The trailer, of course, is already in theaters. And guess what? It's also right here in the Vortex. So why don't we all we take a look? Last. Mm. last and only line of defense. You're under arrest for violating sections 4153 of the Tyco Treaty. Step away from your busted ass vehicle and put your hands on your head. You know how to use these things? No idea whatsoever. Men in Black. Protecting the Earth from the scum of the universe. Okay, there you have it. Obviously, they're going for the sci-fi audience there, but as well, it looks like a comedy, Tom. You're our trailer park host, expert on these trailers. Wh who are they going for here in this particular trailer? Oh, I think they're always going for the 14 to 24-year-olds, because yeah. those are the people who go to the movies. Right. Uh, looking at that, I, I noticed it ran into that sculpture that's uh, right near Shea Stadium. Mm. I wish they had plowed into Shea Stadium <laughs> when the Mets were playing. That's my first reaction. Right. Jeff, what do you think? Who are they going for in that particular trailer? Oh, they're going to go for Will Smith fans. And Absolutely. they're going to go for science fiction fans. they right. got Will Smith fighting aliens again uh, coming off Independence Day. Yeah, it uh, did look like Independence yeah, Day. Sure. Well, it kind of had an Independence Day feel there, didn't it, Jim? What do you think? Uh, yeah, I've actually seen about 20 minutes of the movie. And uh, you're right. They're going for all those people. The studio wants a franchise. They really want a movie that they can keep making sequels and sequels. And um, it actually looks like it's pretty entertaining. As far as a trailer goes, it's more like what I think a lot of people want. They don't give the whole thing away. Right. You know, there's still something to see when you line up and get your ticket in sure. May, I think it is, or July. Hey, don't you guys think that in some <laughs> situations, there have been a few, and one comes to mind with me is First Contact. That trailer kind of gave away, you knew what the board was up to because of the trailer. Do you agree with me, Jim? Well, see, they kind of screwed the pooch in a way because the whole TV show gave away what the movie was going to be right, about. Right, right. But, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's very frustrating sometimes if you go in and you see a trailer, it's like a 60-second trailer, and it's like, well... Right. I can save seven bucks. I don't need to go see exactly. this. Exactly. Well, that was the first Star Trek film that was made by the fans for the fans. Mm -hmm. And I think it had that sensibility to it. And in that yeah. sense, they're going to go anyway. This really reached the hardcore Star Trek fans. So whatever you can load the trailer with, just load it, because you're right. just going to get more people in opening weekend. Exactly. Okay, guys, time to go to a viewer, viewer letter. What do you think? Let's go to one. This is a real viewer letter. This is, we got two last okay. year. Okay, okay, here's one. One of our viewers, Gary Joelbach, emailed us in what he would like to see in a theatrical trailer. Here's what he writes. Just once, I wish that a movie studio would release a movie where the only thing you knew was that it starred so-and-so, is rated whatever, and is titled, fill, you know, fill in the blank. Why don't the studios do it just like that? It seems like a logical marketing ploy. Jim, do you agree with that letter? No, I mean, <clears throat> that's, uh, he's not describing a trailer there. He's describing an ad in variety. Exactly. Although ads in variety probably are a little more interesting than that. Right. Well, Jeff, what do you think? 
He's describing a billboard, basically, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, this is like the old art house or foreign film type of trailers, which are really boring when it comes right down to it. And when you're dealing with a business where anticipation and awareness are half the battle, you've got to get to people long right. in advance to build that. Right. I say hire him and give him his own parking spot. <laughs> I mean, the kid's brilliant. Okay. Well, on that note, don't go away, folks. We got more trailers and discussion in the war room. It's all when SF Vortex returns. Right, that trailer from The Fifth Element didn't really show much, though. But that's exactly what we're talking about here, folks. We're talking trailers with marketing guru Jeff Walker, freelance sci-fi writer James E. Brooks, and the host of my second favorite show right here on the Sci-Fi Channel, Trailer Park. And, of course, I speak of Tom Davis right here. Now, what would you think of that trailer? Not really showing much, Jeff. No, not at all. It's very much what our last letter, letter writer was asking Is that going to gonna get you to go see that movie? The, the, the it wouldn't get me to go see the movie. Uh, it doesn't even mention the star. It doesn't mention the director. Uh, that's Bruce, Bruce Willis and Luc Besson. I mean, they're well-known people. Uh, the trailer people. was just like a billboard. That's all. It, but it was I'll bet that fifth element is a lot more interesting than the first four. <laughs> I've got a feeling. And I'll bet you the director had something to do with the script. Uh, just a guess. Jim, did it get your curiosity? up at all? No, it, 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 it kind of irritated me a little <laughs> bit, actually, because I think that's, I think that's, you're right, that, that's almost tailor-made for what the letter writer wanted, but uh, there's such a thing as too much, but there's also such a thing as too little, and I think that errs it, it on the side of too It could be a great little. movie, but we don't know. We have no right. idea. We'll have to wait for the next uh, trailer. Uh, I'll, I'll wait till it comes on TV. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> building awareness, building anticipation for a film is half the battle of getting people into a theater. This right. obviously doesn't do that. Here's what I wanted to ask you, Jeff. How about, let's take a movie like Twister, for instance. The, the trailer came out, and there was some pretty amazing footage there that wasn't in the movie. What's happening there? That's not ethical. That's like well, false advertisement. No, it's perfectly eth ethical. The, the, the trailer makers are using with the footage that's given to them. They don't know what's going to be in the film. Right. In, in Twister's case, you have an unusual circumstance in that the first teaser actually contained the CGI shot that got the movie greenlit by the studio that proved they could do the Twister, that they could do a tornado. Oh. And that subsequently played so strongly in-house, they decided to fold it into the first teaser. So what you're seeing there is a test. Okay. When that, when the but that's sort of a no-lose situation. I mean, I just want to see the tornado. You know? <laughs> I want to see the tornado, and, and they delivered in that movie. So oh, I, was... I saw the tornado, what, five times or something? That and was they the delivered in the trailer. The show. It they was showed a great it in the tornado. How soon sometimes is a trailer made? Is, is sometimes a trailer made during the filming of the, of, of the actual movie? Sometimes you'll get a teaser that is made during the filming. Right. Um, you're not going to get anything that has obviously has special effects in it, because right. these days those aren't even done till the week before a picture opens. Okay. Speaking of a lot of special effects, Starship Troopers is scheduled for a November release. And with this trailer, folks, I think it's pretty sure that what you see is what you get. Since his existence, man has ruled the Earth. In the future, the rules will change. I'm going. Wow. Great Jim, trailer. Are you going? I'm going. It looks, That's a great trailer. It looks great. Yeah, and, and I think uh, it's got a lot of energy. It, it shows some of the stuff that you want to see. Are the bugs going to look good? How the battle sequence is going to look? But it doesn't really give away the story. I suspect that uh, Jeff was mentioning earlier that this is aimed, this is something that the 14 year olds really. 14-year-old well, boys. Boys, is what I want to right? Point out. It's it's not not a date. I have to drag her to that one. <laughs> yeah, Tom, this this is not a trailer? date movie, guys. It was, no. a, it was a great trailer. I loved it, but I'm a boy. 
Yeah. I, I like I like the guns. I like the big insects coming up. My my wife is she, she's going to want to go see the. Woody so you're going to be coming. camping out at Toys R Us when this picture comes out, right? <laughs> yeah. I'll have to collect it. Jeff, cool. what do you think? <laughs> it's a terrific trailer. I think the movie's going to be terrific, and I'm actually working on it. So if I should probably qualify what I'm saying. I that. think it's a terrific <laughs> movie. <laughs> but real quick, before I got 30 seconds, what about that little shot there from the director of? Sometimes from the producer of. Does that help? Oh boy, it does a lot. Uh, um, I mean, Total Recall was a fabulous film. Right. And what else did they? Robo Robocop. Robocop. Right. Yeah, great, great film. Movie. And uh, I also would like to point out that it's it's a Heinlein story, which yes. is a great. That's right. It starts out with a great writer. Right. Yeah. It's this, all in the this. writing. I got to get out of here. That's it for the war, and we're out of time already. I want to thank Jeff Walker, James E. Brooks, and Tom Davis. What show you want again? Trailer Park. <laughs> Only yeah. on the. Sci-fi network. There, yeah, I have it. Sci-fi channel. <laughs> You guys be validated for your space it. parking. <laughs> it's a joke. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere, folks. Lots more here in the vortex. We'll see you in a moment. All right, welcome back to SF Vortex, everybody. You know, fans of the X Files have a new magazine arriving on the stands this Monday. It's the premier issue of the official X Files magazine, and it offers interviews with creator Chris Carter, Jillian Anderson, and exclusive behind the scenes info as well. All right, let's reach into our electronic mailbag and pull out a question from one of our viewers. Steve Murphy asks When will SG1 be starting and on what network? Well, good question, Steve, because last week I neglected to tell everyone that SG-1 will premiere July 18th only on Showtime. And we'll have a preview as soon as that debut gets a little bit closer. Please continue to... ...edition of SF Vortex. That's all the sci-fi info we could gather up. Hey, Alan Putro in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Take care of that back. See you next time, everybody.